We are here with the RSNA webinar devoted to cardiovascular manifestations in COVID-19. My name is Diana Litmanovich and I'm the webinar lead. I'm an associated professor at Harvard Medical School, where I'm also serving as the chief of cardiothoracic imaging at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. COVID-19 refers to the clinical manifestation of infection with severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. And here comes the name SARS-CoV-2. As of July 27th of 2020, COVID-19 has affected more than 13 millions of people and healed close to 600,000 people worldwide. As the knowledge from the clinical, translational, and basic science grows, there is also an increasing awareness of the cardiovascular manifestations of COVID-19 disease and its adverse impact on prognosis. There is also growing understanding of the pathophysiology of cardiac and diffuse vascular involvement, including neuro, cardiac, coronary, pulmonary, abdominal, and extremity vascular involvement. In other words, multi-system, multi-vessel involvement. The multi-system nature of the disease in significant number of cases with adverse impact on prognosis has been demonstrated and recorded worldwide and cardiovascular considerations also impact the invasive and non-invasive treatment strategies. In this webinar, we will talk about the four following groups of manifestations and treatments of cardiovascular manifestations in COVID-19. The first part will be devoted to cardiac, coronary, and pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19 disease. Our first speaker, Rachel Kirkbride, We'll talk about the pathophysiology of vascular involvement. Rachel Kirkbride is currently a cardiothoracic radiology research fellow at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard Medical School. I will be presenting the coronary artery involvement in COVID-19 in both adult and pediatric population. The topic of pulmonary, micro, and macrovascular manifestations of COVID-19 will be presented by Dr. Linda Haramati, who is a professor of radiology and medicine and division lead in cardiothoracic imaging in Bronx, New York, in Montefiore University Hospital, and by Adina Haramati, who is a senior radiology resident in Norswell House at Manhasset, New York. Cardiac manifestations of COVID-19 will be presented by Dr. Karen Ordobas, Professor of Radiology and Medicine and Director of Cardiac Imaging in University of California, San Francisco. Hi, I'm Rachel Kirkbride, and I'm going to be talking to you about the pathophysiology of vascular involvement in COVID-19 infection. As of the 13th of July, there's been over 13 million cases of COVID-19 and over 570,000 deaths. And as you can see from this graph, the rates of new cases daily are still increasing. So it's really important that we understand the pathophysiology of this infection in order to manage patients appropriately. So blood vessels may be the key to understanding COVID-19 infection, with recent headlines such as coronavirus may be a blood vessel disease, which explains everything. Autopsies turn up strange features of COVID-19 lungs. Study finds more thrombi and a new puzzle in the vessels. A new study shows COVID-19 causes severe blood vessel damage. So what are the vascular findings associated with COVID-19 infection? There's been studies showing vascular involvement throughout the body. There's been high rates of thromboembolism seen, especially in ICU patients, and cases of lung microthrombi. Radiology studies have shown subsegmental vessel enlargement in the lungs in up to 89% of patients. Cardiac, neurological, and abdominal vascular manifestations have also been associated with this infection, along with increased rates of limb ischemia. The pathophysiology of vascular involvement has been hypothesized in the literature. This diagram shows a capillary lined by endothelial cells in relation to an alveoli in the lungs. The um, SARS-CoV-2 virus can directly enter these endothelial cells cells, and it does this through the ACE2 receptor. 
This can cause damage to the endothelial cells and it can activate these cells. And this activation can lead to a number of responses. Firstly, you can get vascular leakage. And this happens by the endothelial cells moving apart and loosening. And this can cause fluid to leak out in between the cells and cause local edema. And in this case, it can cause pulmonary edema. Secondary, you can get increased clotting. As these endothelial cells move apart, it exposes the basement membrane. And this exposure can trigger the clotting cascade as well as a pro-coagulant state. And this can lead to increased D-dimer levels in the blood, increased platelet aggregation, and fibrin clot formation, resulting in micro-macro thrombosis. And thirdly, you can get increased inflammation. Inflammatory cells can leak out from the blood into the surrounding tissues and cause local edema. And cytokines can be released, resulting in a cytokine storm that can cause systemic inflammation. It is known that patients with the metabolic syndrome have poorer outcomes in COVID-19 infection. And this may be explained by the, their pre-existing endothelial dysfunction. So what is the evidence of altered coagulation? Tang et al. showed that compared to survivors, COVID non-survivors have significantly higher D-dimer levels, increased prothrombin time, and rates of disseminated intravascular coagulation. Ackerman et al. showed that alveolar capillary microthrombi are nine times more prevalent in COVID versus H1N1 influenza patients. And this study showed small thrombi present throughout the body in organs such as the kidney, spleen, and heart. There's also evidence of altered angiogenesis in COVID-19 patients. Angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels in response to tissue ischemia. And again, the study by Ackerman showed that new vessel formation is 2.7 times higher in the lungs of those with COVID than in those with H1N1 influenza. And they postulated that this might be due to the high levels of endotheliitis and thrombosis in these patients. And lastly, I just want to touch on the non-coronary cardiac involvement in COVID-19 infection, as this will be discussed later in the webinar. This diagram nicely summarizes the mechanisms of how this infection affects the heart. So this can happen through direct toxicity of the virus into the cardiac myocytes, through hypoxemia-mediated mechanisms, supply-demand mismatch, cytokine storm, and DIC. This can result in pathologies such as acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias, myocarditis, venous thromboembolism, and heart failure or cardiogenic shock. So in summary, vascular involvement plays a central role in COVID-19 infection. I briefly summarized this pathophysiology, discussing endothelial injury and activation, which can occur through direct invasion with the COVID-19 virus, resulting in vascular leakage, increased clotting, and inflammation. Microthrombosis, which is seen in multiple organs throughout the body, increased rates of macrothrombosis, and angiogenesis, which is a distinct feature in the lungs compared to other viral infections. Here are my references. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diana Litmanovich, and I'm going to discuss coronary artery involvement in COVID-19 patients, both adult and pediatric population. Cardiac and coronary symptoms in COVID-19 adult and pediatric populations have been demonstrated in uh, the beginning, mid, and late stages of the disease. In adults, the cardiovascular symptoms, including STEMI, may be the first clinical manifestation. Those cardiovascular symptoms may develop within days or months of COVID infections. And in 40% of COVID patients with STEMI, the culprit lesion is not identifiable by coronary angiography. Cardiac conditions contributed so far to approximately 40% of mortality, either alone or in conjunction with respiratory failure. In children, multisystem inflammatory syndrome was described that may involve coronary arteries. And in contrary to the adults, the onset of that syndrome is delayed weeks or months after presumed COVID-19 infection or proved COVID-19 infection. So let's start the discussion with the adult pathophysiology and the clinical picture of uh, cardiac and coronary involvement. As we know, the illness severity in COVID-19 patient has a wide spectrum. 
from asymptomatic individuals to death. And there are multiple factors that are potentially influencing the phenotypic presentation and illness severity. Those are the host factors such as age and comorbid health conditions and multiple others, as well as the factors which are outside of the host, such as co-infections, environmental function, uh, environmental uh, factors, socioeconomic status, or potential uh, therapeutic interventions and genetic variants of the virus itself. The clinical phenotype varies, and the uh, two types that I would like to focus on right now are the pure cardiac and the mixed cardiac and pulmonary subtypes. Those subtypes, mixed pulmonary and cardiac disease and cardiac predominant disease, correspond to a significant proportion of the cases. The mixed type is approximately 10 to 25 percent, depending on the reports, and the cardiac predominant type are less common, less than 5 percent. So in the mixed pulmonary and cardiac phenotype, usually the patients present with a typical appearance of pneumonia, with severely elevated and rising troponin levels, severely elevated inflammatory biomarkers, and hemodynamic and clinical deterioration well into their hospitalization for viral pneumonia. So it starts with an accent on pulmonary and continues toward the cardiac. In the cardiac predominant subtype, the presentation is atypical for COVID. There is no pneumonia. There is usually chest pain, abnormal inflammatory biomarkers, and patients present with, uh, in addition to chest pain, with palpitation, syncope, or arrhythmia. So in the mixed pulmonary and cardiac phenotype, the acute myocardial infarction is usually due to non-obstructive coronary artery disease, and then the arrhythmias, complete heart block, effusion, tamponade, and thromboembolic complications are superimposed or added to that. With a cardiac predominant presentation, the acute coronary syndrome, such as STEMI or NSTEMI, is the uh, presenting symptom, and it's usually type 1 myocardial infarction. The acute myocardial infarction might be with a non-obstructive coronary artery disease, and then additional uh, cardiac manifestations are added into the presentation of the patient. So if we summarize all the COVID-19 cardiovascular diseases, they would present the acute COVID-19 cardiovascular syndrome. That can cause the acute coronary syndrome with obstructive coronary artery disease, the acute myocardial injury with non-obstructive coronary artery disease, and then the heart failure, cardiogenic shock, myocarditis, arrhythmias, pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, and blood pressure fluctuations are all part of this acute COVID-19 cardiovascular syndrome. The cardiac condition, again, I would like to reemphasize that, contribute to up to 40% of overall COVID-19 related mortality. The pathophysiology, which is currently proposed, is based on our current understanding of the uh, COVID-19 related immune response. And this is definitely an area where our knowledge keeps growing and our understanding in some time from now might be deeper and slightly different. So what I'm currently presenting is the current concept of the proposed pathophysiology. It starts with a high ACE2 expression in the cardiac and vascular tissues, which facilitates the cellular entry of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes myocardial and vascular damage. Aberrant T cells and monocyte activations cause systemic hyperinflammatory response, which causes in turn leukocyte adhesion molecular expression on the endothelial cells of the pre existing atherosclerotic lesion. So here we come to the connection between the inflammatory response and the coronary artery disease. So this expression of the uh, leukocyte adhesion molecule on the endothelial cell causes the atherosclerotic lesion to become unstable. And as the end result of that, predispose the patient to acute coronary syndrome. The systemic inflammatory response activates as well the microvascular endothelium that causes in turn the dysfunction of the coronary microvasculature with myocardial ischemia and myocardial injury without an obstructing 
lesion within the uh, main coronary arteries. On the other hand, another very important contributing factor is the decreased myocardial oxygen supply. Severe COVID-19 respiratory complications and hypoxia and increased myocardial oxygen demand due to hyperinflammatory status correspond to the mismatch in the oxygen supply with eventual decrease of the relative supply of the oxygen to the myocardium. Also, an important point is that the binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptors causes internalization of the ACE2 receptors and loss of the external ACE2 catalytic effect with subsequent decrease eventually of the androgen circulating in patients with COVID-19, which is in turn contributes to compromising the cardiac function. Coronary ischemia that leads to infarction can be presented as type 1 or type 2 myocardial infarction. Both ST elevation MI and non-ST elevation MI have been documented. And for the type 1 myocardial infarction, the plaque instability due to this uh, ACE2 in vascular endothelial cell receptors can eventually cause the occlusion and also the severe systemic inflammatory response in the third phase of the disease is associated with even higher contribution of this pathophysiology to the uh, occlusive disease within the coronary arteries. With type 2 MI, we have the demand ischemia we talked about, hypoxia secondary to lung involvement and fever and tachycardia secondary to sepsis. There is a presence of microangiopathy due to systemic vasculitis as one of the mechanisms and then the myocarditis after the infection, and also the virus-related endothelial dysfunction. The cytokine storm is also known to be contributing effect to the type 2 myocardial infarction. What is the management of those patients? So if we are talking about the management of COVID-suspected or proven patients with uh, ST elevation MI, the primary PCI is a standard of care similar to the patients without COVID infection. The fibrinolytic therapy is for patients with relative contraindications to primary PCI or those with severe bilateral COVID pneumonia or ARDS that are considered to be not suitable candidates for PCI. Management of non-ST elevation MI varies between high and low risk patients. For high risk patients or hemodynamically unstable patients, the early invasive strategy is the way to go. And the low risk patients should benefit from non-invasive or medical approach. This graph summarized the management of the ST elevation MI in COVID-19 confirmed and suspected patients. And again, the very important component here is to differentiate the individuals into high risk versus low risk individuals, where the high risk individuals will go to the primary PCI unless they have the uh, contraindications that we uh, just described. Coronary computer tomography and geography or coronary CTA has an important role in assessment of the potential coronary disease in patients with COVID-19 known or suspected infection. That can be used for uh, risk stratification, and also it has an added advantage of evaluating the lung parenchyma, the presence of pulmonary embolism, or the presence of right ventricular failure. North American Society of Cardiovascular Imaging has released a statement where it talks about the potential use of the cardiac non-invasive imaging during the COVID-19 outbreak. And the two potential implications would be in patients with elevated troponin and equivocal diagnosis of NSTEMI that usually would be taken to invasive coronary angiography, but coronary CT is a very suitable substitute. And also patients, for example, with acute chest pain, negative initial troponin, who are at the intermediate risk. And again, they would usually go to the coronary uh, angiography invasive uh, strategy, and they can be assessed with coronary CT as well. To echo the same recommendations, the uh, Society of Cardiac CT has released their statement where they also talk about the cardiovascular imaging specific to the COVID-19 era with specific indications for patients where the coronary CT would be the best initial imaging modality 
currently as opposite to the usual strategies with intervention uh, or invasive strategy would be the first choice. So to summarize the COVID-19 cardiovascular uh, symptoms in adults, the cardiovascular symptoms, including STEMI, might be the presenting symptoms in the minority of adult COVID-19 patients. This is the main or one of the main causes of mortality. And the disease comes as an activation of the cascade of the systemic hyperinflammatory response is the proposed mechanism for both the coronary artery occlusion and the microvascular disease, as well as the cardiomyopathy. The management of acute cardiac events should be adjusted to ensure optimal treatment results in this uh, patient population. And coronary CTA has an important role in triaging and restratification of those patients. We'll continue now with discussing the second group of patients, the children population with COVID-19 and their uh, cardiovascular manifestations, specifically coronary manifestations. Originally, children were not really in the uh, spotlight of a COVID-19 infection. First, they were a very minority. They were really less than 2% of national COVID-19 cases in the United States. And this number was similar across the globe. And also, even if infected with COVID-19, the disease was characterized by low severity and low mortality. They become a center of attention or one of the centers of attention because of the two following reasons. A, the degree to which children transmit COVID-19 is the key to lockdown reopening in many geographic areas. But what is more pertinent to our current topic is the new concern about a novel, severe Kawasaki-like disease in children, which is related to COVID-19, with a clinical course which is substantially more morbid than the usual Kawasaki disease. So the patients uh, that were presented with the disease had a variety of the clinical symptoms. What was uniting them is fever, but then the symptoms could be gastrointestinal, rash, variable disease severity, including shock and myocardial injury. They also have demonstrated deteriorating myocardial function, pancarditis, myocarditis, pericardial effusion, and coronary artery aneurysms where the similarity with Kawasaki disease emerged. In terms of their laboratory, laboratory testing, they had neutrophilia with lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, and low albumin. They all had high C-reactive protein, ferritin, D-dimer, troponin, and fibrinogen, so the uh, inflammatory markers. And they were negative for the PCR, for the presence of the uh, COVID-19, on not only nasal or oropharyngeal swabs, but also at the bronchial velar lavage. The majority, but not all of them, but the overwhelming majority, more than 90%, had the IgG positive consistent with prior infection. Two terms have been coined, one in the United States and the other one in UK and European Union, uh, which sound very different, but essentially describing the same disease. In the United States, the systemic disease in children is called multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. And in uh, Europe and United Kingdom, it's called pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome, temporary associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. So again, those are the uh, similar uh, descriptions, essentially same disease, two different terms. Multiple reports throughout the globe have discussed those clusters of pediatric population with similar presentation associated with this acute fever start and also inflammatory responses involving multiple organs in the patients who were not currently sick with COVID-19 infection. They were reported first in Italy in the original uh, spike of the COVID-19 epicenter in Bergamo, they were seen in Paris, in London, and in United States. One of the largest series have described the findings that were consistent with coronary artery aneurysms, as presented on this image, in this probably the largest series of 35 patients. 
and as well airway inflammation and rapid development of pulmonary edema and other additional findings of inflammatory disease such as extensive right iliac fossa inflammatory changes on abdominal imaging. The other group has reported the uh, presentation of COVID-19 with ERDS and cytokine storm without respiratory syndrome. And again, there was a case where there was a presence of coronary uh, artery dilatation and presence of pulmonary edema. An additional series of eight children, slightly smaller, but what united those kids was the epibrite coronary vessels with progression to giant coronary aneurysm in one of them within a week of discharge from pediatric intensive care. Those clusters of uh, pediatric patients and associated abnormalities in all this uh, spectrum that we have discussed uh, both laboratory markings, clinical findings, and imaging findings led to uh, creation of the specific criteria to identify uh, the syndrome. Uh, those criteria differ slightly between the Center of Disease Control, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and World Health Organization. But what unites all of them is the presence of the fever, the laborato laboratory evidence of the inflammatory markers, and uh, the positive uh, current or recent infection with COVID-19. And they're the ones that are currently used to diagnose the syndrome. So in uh, summary, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children and the cardiac coronary symptoms are classified as delayed onset after COVID-19 infection as opposite to adults where the cardiac involvement comes within the active uh, disease, within the active infection. The cardiac and coronary symptoms are part of the multisystem inflammatory syndrome, and they are associated with toxic shock syndrome and Kawasaki-like symptoms together with cardiac inflammation. Now, the coronary arteries are similar to Kawasaki disease, but the clinical signs and outcome are different from Kawasaki disease. The treatment are, is intravenous immunoglobulin, but also in the majority of the kids, the steroids and the biologics treatment was necessary to achieve their clinical improvement. To summarize our both adult and pediatric populations, cardiac and coronary involvement is present in COVID-19 infected adults and children. They are affected, adults and children are affected at different time points of the disease, and the hyperinflammatory systemic response is the culprit in both populations. Coronary CTA might play an important role in diagnosis and triaging in those both age groups. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Linda Haramadi from Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, and my collaborator is Adina Haramadi from Northwell Health in Manhasset, we're both from New York, and I will be talking about pulmonary micro and macrovascular manifestations of COVID-19. So there are a lot of evolving pieces of knowledge that have to do with pulmonary vascular disease and COVID-19, and I am going to try to address some of the questions and issues that we've encountered as we are in the midst of this pandemic. Is there a true increased incidence of pulmonary embolism in COVID-19, or are we just seeing a higher volume of critically ill at-risk patients? What's the meaning of the dilated vessel sign that was initially described in the lungs of COVID-19 patients early on when the infection was just present in China and has persisted till now? What's our current understanding of pulmonary microvascular disease? What are some changes um, in the diagnostic imaging pathways that we've encountered and, um, uh, and in other locations? And what is the relationship between treatment of thrombosis and mortality? So I'll start with the case. Here we have a 66-year-old woman with a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia who had new onset of dyspnea and atrial fibrillation as an outpatient. She had COVID-19 test positive and on her lungs, 
we can appreciate the typical findings of COVID-19 with bilateral peripheral predominant ground glass and consolidative opacities. On pulmonary embolism imaging, we note large bilateral central pulmonary emboli with mild findings of right heart strain. So this is a COVID patient with a classic pulmonary embolism. Now, what is that risk of thrombosis in patients with pulmonary embolism? Is it elevated or are we just seeing a ton of uh, critically ill patients? Uh, this prospective series by Helms et al of 150 patients with COVID from ARDS and 400 ICUs in France over a one month period looked at the incidence of thrombotic events in their population. And what they found is the surprisingly high rate, 64 thrombotic complications in these 150 patients, and they were mainly pulmonary emboli. They had a prospective cohort of um, ARDS patients in the six years preceding uh, COVID, and they matched the the prospective cohort series with the pre-COVID ARDS cohort, and they found substantially more thrombotic events in COVID ARDS than in non-COVID ARDS, 11.7% versus 4.8%. And it was mostly pulmonary emboli, 11.7% versus 2.1%, very statistically significant. And this was despite the administration of prophylactic or therapeutic anticoagulation in all patients. Here we have a 59-year-old man, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, who had shortness of breath and fever. It's a typical COVID patient from the Bronx um, with multiple comorbidities on his lung windows from his CT. We see bilateral patchy ground glass opacities with small foci of confluence. We also see a small dilated vessel in the anterior right upper lobe. Uh, he underwent dual energy CT for suspected pulmonary embolism, and we see a perfusion defect in the anterior right upper lobe subsegmentally. And when we take a close look at that vessel, we see a filling defect within it. This is a patient who didn't have DVT, and um, we interpreted the scan as either an isolated small subsegmental pulmonary embolism, or perhaps there's an in situ thrombosis within that vessel. We weren't sure. More insights are being revealed by this dual energy CT in our study of the pulmonary blood flow on radiology, including this interesting article by Lang et al published in Lancet Infectious Diseases, where they looked at dual energy CTs performed for suspected pulmonary embolism in patients with COVID, and the patients did not have pulmonary emboli. But in fact, what they described is in the areas of pulmonary opacity, there were increased dilated blood vessels that were patent. And on the perfusion maps, we see increased perfusion in the lung, both proximal and distal to the lung opacities. And they propose that this is due to regional vasodilatation rather than vasoconstriction to the hypoventilated lung related to a dysfunctional diffuse inflammatory process that led to paradoxical shunting of blood towards the hypoventilated region rather than the normal physiologic hypoxic vasoconstriction. And this may be a, an explanation for the happy hypoxic which is a clinical mystery of COVID-19 where you have profoundly hypoxemic patients who are relatively well appearing. This interesting article by Ackerman et al, uh, published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine was an autopsy study that evaluated seven lungs from COVID ARDS patients, seven lungs from influenza A, H1, N1 ARDS, and 10 age match controls. Um, in the COVID and influenza lungs, they found diffuse alveolar damage with perivascular T-cell infiltration, which is typical for ARDS. However, the COVID lungs had distinct vascular features that differed from the influenza lungs. 
It showed severe endothelial injury with intracellular virus and disrupted cell membranes. The pulmonary vessels had white thromb widespread thrombosis with microangiopathy, and the alveolar capillary microthrombi were nine times more common. And very interestingly, this new vessel growth was noted predominantly by a process called intersusceptive angiogenesis. And the new vessel growth was most common in the affected consolidated lung. Now, what is this intersusceptive angiogenesis? Um, what happens is when there is increased blood flow, the blood vessel dilates and there is increased shear stress on the wall of these dilated vessels as depicted in this beautiful diagram by D'Amico et al. The increased wall stress leads to pillar formation within the lumen of the blood vessel. And so that the blood vessel splits into two and um, there is decrease in wall stress within each of the vascular lumens. And this is a form of angiogenesis where due to splitting of the blood vessel. And it, it, um, it goes along with our visualization of these multiple dilated vessels in the uh, pulmonary vasculature supplying the COVID uh, pneumonia areas. COVID has led to a lot of alterations in imaging in um, our, our usual practice, and it varies by different nations, so different national guidelines. For example, in China, very early on, non-contrast CT was used to diagnose COVID. Um, the American College of Radiology recommended against routine use of CT in the diagnosis of COVID. There are also variations in institutional practices and resources and also reactions that people have made in response to the disease prevalence and uh, uh, our ability to uh, decrease um, transmission of the infection. In my practice in Montefiore in the Bronx, we had a veritable tsunami of COVID in the spring of 2020. Montefiore saw more than 6,000 COVID patients in that period of time. And our dominant imaging modality was portable radiography. And we used portable radiographs to reduce the risk of infection by transporting patients. We also were reluctant to transport gravely ill patients due to their tenuous status. And in the ICU, point of care ultrasound was used very commonly to evaluate both the lungs and the cardiovascular system. When we were contemplating doing a CT scan, there was attending to attending discussion of each case to assess the risk benefit. And we learned a lot from that process. This wasn't the process of, um, of blocking CTs, but rather so that we could learn as much as possible from our clinical colleagues and figure out what's best for the patient. One of the reasons we did not as many CTs as other places is because um, once it, the thrombosis complication was recognized, there was a lot of empiric anticoagulation of patients who met a certain D-dimer threshold, so they were already receiving therapeutic anticoagulation. Another unusual, uh, unique um, practice that we have at Montefiore is that we use nuclear medicine very frequently in PE diagnostics. And we had to alter our nuclear medicine diagnostic algorithm as well. Normally, if a patient has a clear chest radiograph, the patient will undergo a VQ scan. And if the radiograph shows parenchymal lung abnormalities, they would be triaged to CT. However, because our ventilation agent is aerosolized DTPA, and there's always leakage of aerosolized agent, we, we um, decided during COVID to revert to perfusion only lung scans to reduce the risk um, of infection due to the aerosolization process. And um, this is an example of one such patient, a 33-year-old woman with shortness of breath on progestomerone therapy for infertility who had a normal x-ray and she had COVID diagnosis. And we see here a perfectly beautiful normal perfusion scan ruling out pulmonary embolism in this patient. Now, in terms of diagnosing pulmonary emboli in COVID, making the diagnosis is important, but the data regard, regarding specifically the mortality risk from PE in patients with COVID is presently equivocal. 
And the reason is because pulmonary emboli in COVID occur in a complex medical situation. Patients will often have thrombosis in multiple other vessels. They have ARDS, they can have multi-organ dysfunction so that untangling the effect of pulmonary embolism when there are so many competing risk factors for mortality has been difficult. And it's uh, a question that remains to be answered because of the complexity of these patients. However, there is literature um, supporting the use of heparin treatment and improved survival in patients with COVID-19. And there are a number of articles. This is a large observational study of more than 2,000 COVID patients from Spain over a um, about a two month period that had over uh, eight days of median follow up. And uh, the data were extracted from the chart, including demographics, variety of clinical and medical information. And they looked at the main outcome, mortality. And they found that a use of heparin therapy was associated with lower mortality when adjusted for age and gender, when looking at the pa patient's oxygen sa saturation and fever, and even when all the other drugs were added to the mix. So this is observational data. It's not a randomized clinical trial, but it strongly suggests an association between heparin therapy and survival in patients with COVID-19. So in conclusion, the current evidence suggests that there is a true increase in pulmonary embolism incidence in COVID. The dilated vessel sign that was observed in the lungs early in the COVID pandemic likely reflects both vascular thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and hemodynamic alterations. Diagnostic imaging changes vary based on different national guidelines, institutional practices, resources and disease prevalence and really needs to be tailored to each uh, clinical environment. Thrombosis treatment in COVID is associated with improved survival. Thank you. Hello, my name is Karen Ordova, and I'm gonna be discussing cardiac manifestations of COVID-19. These are my disclosures. The outline of this presentation is going to start with myocardial injury mechanisms, prognostic impact of myocardial injury, and imaging appearance, primarily with CMR. Several studies have looked at potential mechanisms for myocardial injury by COVID-19. The hallmark of myocardial injury is the presence of troponin elevation. The most accepted mechanisms currently are a systemic inflammatory reaction that affects the myocardial cells systemically, leading to capillary leakage and myocardial edema. Currently, there's no evidence of direct viral toxicity effect. Cells, including cardiovascular tissue that express ACE2 receptors are considered at risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection. This diagram illustrates the effect of COVID-19 in the conversion from angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7. So the impaired conversion of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7 leads to lack of vasorelaxation, anti-inflammatory effects, antioxidative effects, and antifibrotic effects. Organs that express ACE2 are primarily the lung, but also the kidneys, the brain, the vessels, uh, and the heart. Troponin elevation has been identified in patients with COVID-19. Cardiac troponin-1 is significantly higher in patients with severe COVID-19 infection compared with those with known severe disease. A systematic review of four studies, including 374 patients, have shown an odds ratio of 25.6 for severe disease compared with non-severe disease. A study from Chinese patients, 138 patients, have shown that cardiac injury is related to severity of COVID-19 infection. 
The study showed that among hospitalized patients, 7 to 17 percent had elevated troponins. That number is much higher if patients are in the ICU, approximately 22 percent, and reaches approximately 60 percent in patients that have died from COVID-19. The concept is that the virus affects the myocardium by non-ischemic mechanisms much more frequently than ischemic mechanisms. This diagram from a recent publication shows that the most common mechanism is systemic inflammation accompanied by sepsis, severe hypoxia, pulmonary thrombosis and embolism, and myocardial injuries similar to stress cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. These are all non-ischemic mechanisms of myocardial injury by SARS-CoV-2 virus. The myocardial infarction mechanism is considered much less common, much less common. What does it mean to have elevated troponins uh, in a patient with COVID-19? This recent study from Mount Sinai New York Hospital included 2,726 2, hospitalized patients with an average age of 66.4 years and majority of men have shown a significant prognostic impact of an elevated troponin in mortality. This Kaplan-Meier curve shows uh, in green patients with low troponin elevation, in red intermediate troponin elevation, and in blue patients with high troponin elevation. And uh, as you can appreciate, patients with high troponin elevation have a worse survivor compared to uh, the other two groups. The classic CMR appearance of COVID myocarditis is that of an acute diffuse myocardial injury. Many case reports are now seen in the literature as this one of the first cases reported at JAMA Cardiology, which you can see on the top row, stir sequences showing the fuse increase of signal along the entire left ventricle on both short axis and four chamber views. Corresponding T2 mapping images show the elevated T2 value of uh, the myocardium, again, diffusely across all myocardial regions. A recent series of cases of 10 patients with myocarditis like COVID uh, infection uh, and high troponin and confirmed non-obstructive coronary artery disease has shown us that majority of patients uh, present with this diffuse acute myocardial injury picture. On your right, you can see that eight patients show diffuse edema as evidenced by T2 weighted imaging and elevated T2 signal on T2 mapping, as well as native T1 mapping. Of those, a few patients showed no evidence of late gadolinium enhancement, whereas some patients show mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement in the inferolateral wall, which is typically associated with viral myocarditis. A minority of patients showed a picture very similar to Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. You can see on your left a four-chamber CNA image showing the apical ballooning classic of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and corresponding T2 black blood images and T1 mapping showing edema in the apex without associated late gadolinium enhancement, which are classic features of uh, cardiomyopathy associated with stress. In summary, fuse inflammation is the most likely mechanism of myocardial injury in COVID-19 disease. Elevated troponin has been shown to predict worse outcomes in this population. And the classic appearance on CMR studies are that of increased T2 signal, usually very diffuse, and with or without late gadolinium enhancement uh, that can be seen in the inferolateral wall. I would like to thank RSNA for inviting me to lead the webinar, and I would like to thank all the participants 
that have found the time and devoted to creating those presentations, enlightening us on such an important and timely topic as the multivascular involvement in COVID-19 disease. Thank you very much.